I will share with you today our research on hardware and materials to enable energy efficient brain inspired computing and in particular on artificial synapses that function via the motion of protons and oxygen in solid state. Our motivation for this work, um, I'm trying to scroll, okay. Our motivation for this work is twofold. First, to enable bio-inspired analog hardware to enable advances in artificial intelligence and applications of machine learning. And second, to do that in an energy efficient way. So energy efficient brain inspired computing, but even at a higher level to reduce the energy demand associated with computing, especially in light of really fast increase in the computing energy based on the current computing architectures that we use that in part is rising because of the increased applications and training needs of artificial intelligence. And as you see from this chart, world's energy production across the different decades versus computing energy. If we don't do anything by 2040, we will be hitting the world's energy production limit, which is not viable. And so, alternative new computing platforms are needed in order to reduce this energy demand. And one major cause for this high energy computation when we try to move to analog compute computation is the use of von Neumann architecture that we all rely on at present, which separates the memory unit and the central processing unit and the resulting data that is shuffled back and forth between these two separate units causes a very high energy footprint for computation. And so alternative um, computing architectures are needed. For example, those that can combine memory and processing in one unit and inspired from, from how brain does its computation to result in more than one million fold improvement in energy efficiency in computing so that we do not push the limits of world's energy production as, as shown on this plot. And these numbers are taken from the decadal plan, a recent report of the SRC and SIA. So those numbers are eye-opening. And one alternative architecture which can combine memory and processing in one unit is physical neural networks. And as a result, promise to reduce the energy consumption and, and computation time associated with machine learning algorithms. So in such physical neural network architectures, the crossbars mimic the connectivity of neurons. And the cross points of these crossbars are very important. That's where we do the processing and they can be deemed as analog programmable resistors. And they emulate aspects of synapses in, as in a biological um, neural network. And such physical neural networks relying on different types of programmable resistors have been implemented also in hardware AI chips and there is a lot of excitement and need to advance this field further. So let's take a moment to define what's this key component, the programmable resistor, analog programmable resistor that can serve as cross points to emulate some aspects of synapses. So what this uh, device is, is pretty much a non-volatile random access memory that works by changing the resistance state of a solid state material that is embedded in the device. And the key is that the resistance states are set by the electrical history. And the resulting operation can be either binary or analog. Analog is more of interest to us, but I'll show both in these examples. On the left, what we see is as a function of applied voltage, the current or resistance can be switched from a low resistance to a high resistance, giving rise to an on or an off state. So as we trace this green curve, let's say we increase the voltage, we trace this low resistance state, the on state, and at a certain threshold voltage, 
the resistance becomes high, we go to the off state. As we trace the voltage back at another voltage value, we set the state back to on to the low resistance and cycle back. So that's binary. On the right is an analog example of the same concept, where now we are applying pulses of a certain voltage. So here happens to be minus 2.5 volt. And more than 1,000 pulses gives rise to a continuum of increasing conductance values. And reversal of the voltage pulse polarity reverses the conductance back down to the initial state. So it gives you then a multitude, a continuum of states that allows for analog computing. And these conductance states can also represent the stored node weights in a physical neural network. Again, the key is that the electrical history allows to modulate the state or the resistance state. There are three more commonly and more widely studied mechanisms of resistance modulation. Those are the, the top two and the bottom left. So first is the electrochemical extraction of metal from an active electrode into an insulating solid electrolyte, forming metal dendrites, metal filaments. Pretty much we are electromigration of the metal from the active electrode into the solid electrolyte, causing a conducting filament whose volume, thickness, length we can modulate to give rise to multiple states. And the right one is also filamentary, but now it is electrochemical extraction of oxygen from the insulating metal oxide. And it's accumulation in one of the electrodes, say the top electrode, leaving behind an oxygen vacancy rich zone, which comes with an electron rich zone also, and thus higher electronic conductivity. And the morphology of these zones is also filamentary. The third is phase change um, mechanism, which is joule heating induced thermal phase change between a conducting and an insulating phase of an active material. And a more recent mechanism that has taken our attention as well as few others in the field is ion intercalation modulated conductivity where Again, by using electrochemistry, we take ions from a reservoir and insert them into an insulating material. And the ion insertion comes with electron doping, giving rise to higher conductivity and can be also electrically reversed back. So in my talk, I will first uh, share with you our work on ion intercalation modulated devices and then our work related to addressing some challenges related to oxygen vacancy filamentary devices. Okay, so either way, what are we trying to reproduce? So in the biological synapse, there are different processes that take place that gives rise to synaptic strengthening or weakening. And at least some of these characteristics we should be able to emulate in the, in the solid state device. So one example is the long-term potentiation, that is long-term permanent strengthening of the synaptic connection that makes it easier to transmit signal through those synapses over time. So it's pretty much associated with them an increase in conductance depending on recent local electrical history. So this is data taken from an electrical biological synapse where upon different amounts of electrical stimulation at 10 minutes, five minutes, one minute, or zero as reference, we see different amounts of change in conductance. So here is our starting point. We stimulate for 10 minutes and give rise to about 40% increase in conductance. The shorter the stimulation, the less the conductance change. And if the stimulation is too short, then it's no longer permanent, but the the outcome decays. So the permanent change in conductance associated with long-term potentiation, and if the conductance is actually going down, then it's long-term depression upon local 
um, electrical history. So here is another example now from the device literature, which emulates this long-term potentiation by using inorganic synapses, in particular, the metal filament formation mechanism that I have described a minute ago. So upon sending electrical pulses, the conductance of the device due to formation of metal filaments increases and the change is permanent. So even after you remove the pulse, the conductance increase has been permanent. Good, so there are ways to emulate this behavior, but looking back at the biological synapse, and I'm not able to describe everything going on in the synapse, of course, but a key point is that the signal transmission and the strengthening or weakening of the synapse is associated with electrochemical transmission of small cations, such as calcium, potassium, sodium, magnesium, etc. So in principle, in solid state two, we can leverage electrochemical transmission of small cations, not limited to the ones at the biological synapse, but including others too, such as proton, lithium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, et cetera, in order to emulate aspects of synaptic functions such as long-term potentiation. So we are inspired from this electrochemical transmission of ions in the biological synapse to, to adopt that to solid state. And in fact, this concept has been demonstrated in the last few years, that is electrochemical intercalation of small cations and has shown promising results. So the three examples that I'm showing here are from proton and lithium. So the first one is proton insertion into tungsten oxide, but the proton source is electrolysis of trapped water in this device. And because we are relying on water electrolysis, the energy consumption is high, as you can see from the voltages that are applied in this device. So it is neither practical because it's liquid water, nor uh, energy efficient really. The second example is from lithium, which is pretty much a solid state lithium battery, whereby inserting lithium into a cathode material, lithium cobalt oxide, we can potentiate or increase the conductance or extract lithium out electrochemically and depress the conductance. And this has been shown by groups both at IBM as well as Sandia Labs. And lithium is not quite CMOS compatible though. So there is the search for alternative, more CMOS compatible ions. And the third example is again back to protons. And it's a very nice example, shuffling protons between the two organic electrodes. And, and again, it's like a battery, but the electrodes that are used are, as I said, organic material, which are not CMOS compatible. Plus their properties are such that the relative change in conductance that is achievable is rather small, which makes it more difficult to use them in training. So having seen those examples, we started with the smallest cation proton, but with the goal to implement this in an all inorganic energy efficient and CMOS compatible material set and device architecture. And my collaborators in this work are professors Jesus de la Lamo and Julie at MIT, together with our students and postdocs that have been contributing from both the materials and device and theoretical aspects to this study. And we have been originally supported by the MIT Scoltec program and now working with IBM under the MIT IBM AI lab. And so, as I said, we started with the smallest cation proton because it is the smallest cation, much smaller than the next small cation, which is lithium. For proton, the size in um, semiconductors is pretty much nearly zero. And that gives rise to two important advantages for device application. First is that because it is small, it has high diffusivity that translates to low energy cost in operation. And second, because it's small, the structural disturbance as we insert and extract proton in the material is also small, that translates to longer term operability or endurance. And with proton, 
what we are doing is pretty much running a solid state battery as our electrochemical synapse. And so what we are showing on the sketch is that we need a hydrogen reservoir that should be solid and CMOS compatible. And material that we switch, the channel layer, whose electronic conductance should change with proton insertion. The two separated by an electrolyte that conducts only the protons. So upon, let's say, positive voltage at the hydrogen reservoir, we oxidize the hydrogen to proton, and proton diffuses through the inner circuit, which allows only for proton diffusion because of the electronically insulating electrolyte. And the electrons follow the external circuit and arrive at the channel layer. And I will talk about the mechanism, but this electron plus proton gives rise to pretty much an n-type doping-like behavior, giving rise to conductance increase at the channel layer. And we can electrically reverse the bias and take the proton and the electrons back into the reservoir. So the key enabler in the first, our first proof of principle device for this has been the solid hydrogen source that we could implement, not relying on water and not relying on organic mat matter either, but relying on metals that have high hydrogen solubility, such as palladium hydride. And for the electrolyte, we have adopted a fast proton conducting polymeric electrolyte, nafion. And for the switching layer, the channel layer, we have adopted tungsten oxide, which is a semiconductor to start with. Okay, so a bit more on the mechanism, as we said on the previous slide, as we apply positive potential at the gate, which is our hydrogen reservoir or palladium hydride, we oxidize the hydrogens that follow the inner circuit as proton and enter the tungsten oxide, and the electrons follow the outer circuit, giving rise to hydrogenation of tungsten oxide. So both the protons and the electrons go into tungsten oxide. As we reverse the bias, we extract the protons back from the channel layer through the electrolyte and the electrons from the outer circuit back into the reservoir or the gate layer, leaving behind unprotonated tungsten oxide. Okay, and now we can see the electrical data as a result of stimuli via potential or current pulses, we can potentiate, that is increase the conductance of tungsten oxide in steps. So after each pulse, you can see the permanent increase in conductance of the tungsten oxide layer that starts to look like potentiation and it's non-volatile. After removal of each pulse, the conductance change is permanent. And this mechanism is deterministic. That is, the change in conductivity depends on how much proton we are inserting into the channel layer. And so here, as a result of 200 pulses or one microamp, five milliseconds, we insert about 5% hydrogen in tungsten oxide, giving rise to more than 200 fold change in conductance. And that is not the limit. So we can actually electrochemically insert all the way up to one hydrogen into tungsten oxide. And again, this as a result of about 1,000 pulses of the same uh, cur uh, current and width. And that gives rise to more than seven orders of magnitude change in conductance. So your range of conductance modulation is very large that can give rise to multi-state capability with thousands of states depending on your electrical equipment. And it's very reproducible because as I said, it's deterministic, it's charge controlled, uniform, and depends solely on how much proton and how much electron one-to-one -one, we are inserting and extracting from the channel layer, into and out of the channel layer. As I said, it's reversible, and that has implication for the reliability in training. So when we are trying to capture potentiation and depression, 
potentiation and depression. The more symmetric this curve is, the better it is for use in training physical neural networks. And indeed, we could capture reversible and symmetric potentiation upon hydrogen insertion, as we can see on this example with 200 nanoamp pulses, hydrogen going in with 1,000 pulses, and hydrogen going out with reversal of the polarity of the pulses with another 1,000 pulses down. So very good symmetry and reversibility, which are good characteristics of, of such devices for application. And the extent of change in the conductance depends on which regime you do the potentiation and depression, both the symmetry and the extent of conductance change. So recall again, we can modulate the conductance by seven orders of magnitude, right? So this is a very wide range. We do not have to use the whole range in device modulation. But if we choose, let's say, three regimes of relatively low conductance, medium conductance and high conductance regimes and do the protonation in those regimes, the resulting electrical characteristics are different from each other. So here are the curves of potentiation depression in the low conductance, mid conductance and high conductance regimes. And in the low conductance regime for the same number of pulses, the amount of conductance modulation is higher. So more than 20 compared to the high conductance regime, which is limited to four. And the shape of the curve is also more symmetric. So given that both symmetry and relatively low conductance are more desirable, the latter to reduce leakage related concerns, the operating of such devices in the low protonation or low conductance regime should be more desirable, we think. Okay, and then how about the resulting energy consumption, right? So by tracking the voltage as we apply current pulses in the data that I have shown and using this resulting voltage and the current pulse data, we can compute the energy consumption and that comes to about 3.5 femtojoule per square micrometer per state or per change in conductance that we have tracked in our data. And if you translate that to per unit change in conductance, this becomes 20 order of 20 attojoule per square micrometer per nano Siemens change in conductance. So these are very low numbers. And to put that in context, they are actually comparable to the energy consumption per synaptic event in the brain which is on the order of 1 to 100 femtojoule. And so if you work with a device of square micrometer, the corresponding energy consumption is, is comparable to the biological synapse energy consumption. So this was very motivating for us, even though the device that I have first shown to you here is not really optimized in terms of geometry or even the materials, and despite that, it promised quite good energy efficiency. And so going forward, we worked on scaling down these devices. So the data that I've shown to you was from a macro scale, 100 micrometer scale device. And the challenge, while Nathion is a good practical room temperature proton conductor, the challenge associated with Nathion use in these electrochemical protonic devices is that it's not CMOS compatible. And it was not easy to scale down the device dimensions using Nathion as the electrolyte. So we have recently moved to an inorganic CMOS compatible proton conducting electrolyte, phosphosilicate glass, which has a reasonably good proton conductivity, but it's silica based. So it was also practical, CMOS compatible and practical to scale down the devices with. And as you can see from the sketch, as well as the SEM micrographs below, we could scale down the lateral dimensions of the active channel layer down to two micron. Here, the image is from five micron with very clear, clean borders. 
and the thickness of the layers ranging from five nanometer for the palladium hydride reservoir for hydrogen to 10 nanometers for the electrolyte and the channel layer. So it's, it's very promising that going to the PSG phosphosilicate glass enabled us to keep essentially the same device concept and working principle, but at much reduced device dimensions, both laterally and vertically. And the resulting device properties are also very good, including the symmetry of potentiation and depression, the retention, which is intrinsic to these electrochemical devices, as well as endurance, as you can see from the consistency of the potentiation depression curves after 50,000 pulses here. So beyond the device demonstration, we have probed how the channel layer changes conductance upon protonation in such devices. And sim maybe simplistically thinking, it's due to electron doping upon insertion of hydrogen, so proton plus an electron, and the electrons filling the five the T2G states of tungsten shifting the Fermi level and giving rise to increased carrier concentration. So we do have evidence to this, but it's not the only part, uh, or it's not the end of the story. So by looking at the valence band and tungsten 4F X-ray photoelectron spectrum, we can see that after hydrogenation, we observe the formation or filling of this additional state in the band gap of tungsten oxide, which is associated with the 5D T2G state, giving rise to increased carrier concentration by shifting the Fermi level. And more evidence for that charge transfer to tungsten is seen in the tungsten 5 plus state formation compared to pure tungsten 6 plus in the unprotonated state. So, yeah, indeed, electron transfer to tungsten and serving as anti-doping dope, doping is part of the picture. But beyond that, we have evidence to also change in mobility and phase change. The latter is also associated with mobility change. And the latter, the, the left figure, which shows oxygen KH absorption, X-ray absorption spectrum, gives us evidence to changes in the fingerprint of this spectrum associated with tungsten oxygen hybridization, which translates to increased electromobility with increased protonation. And from the X-ray diffraction pattern, we see a change from monoclinic to a more symmetric tetragonal structure. And our first principles calculations also indicate both a change in the carrier concentration as well as a change in mobility. To start with, tungsten oxide, as I said before, is a semiconductor with about 2.8 EV band gap. Upon small amounts of hydrogen insertion, we create shallow in-gap states that behave like large polarons and serve as dopants, n-type dopants. And the position of these states go further up as we increase the hydrogen concentration. And above 10% of hydrogen, the electronic structure turns metallic because these states merge with the conduction band. And the structure also becomes more symmetric. So these theoretical calculations are consistent with our experimental data, indicating that you both have anti-doping effect at low concentrations of hydrogen, as well as a change in symmetry and an increase in mobility as we go to higher concentrations of hydrogen, especially about 10%. So in summary for this part, I have shown to you that proton-based electrochemical devices can capture some aspects of synapse behavior, in particular, long-term potentiation. And the working principle of such a device is deterministic, charge controlled, modulated electrochemically. And, and you can use different types of ions with different advantages and disadvantages. And here I've shown you 
our demonstration with proton using the smallest cation. And the choice of this ion as well as suitable materials gave rise to very small energy consumption comparable to biological synapses that we are very excited about while we are capturing the potentiation and depression behavior. And the overall range that we could modulate conductivity with is more than seven orders of magnitude, which is really large. We don't have to operate in the whole range, but it does give you the flexibility to choose a regime and obtain a continuum of states for analog computing. And the switching mechanism with ion intercalation, in this case, proton intercalation, relies both on charge carrier density increase as well as a mobility increase. And I've shown you also that by moving away from nafion to inorganic CMOS compatible proton conductors, such as the phosphosilicate glass, enabled us to scale down these devices. And this PSG platform is now also enabling us to study other uh, channel materials with even more advantageous properties compared to tungsten oxide. So we're very excited to continue to, to work on these ionic electrochemical synapses. And in the second part of the talk now, I will move to our work related to oxygen vacancy conductive filament forming oxides and devices. So these are traditionally called RMs, redox-based uh, filamentary switches. And the challenge here is, as seen in this picture, it's filamentary, but the filament can form anywhere in the device layer. And where it forms and the resulting properties of that filament is so far treated stochastically. And that gives rise to large variability in the properties we obtain from these filamentary oxygen vacancy based filamentary devices. And the variability is reflected in the set reset voltages, so what voltage we are obtaining the different conductance states with, as well as in the resulting resistance states that you want to do the computation with. So for example, you take one device and from cycle to cycle with the same electrical history, you can get more than an order of magnitude difference in the resistance states that you're obtaining. For example, the high resistance state uh, distribution shown here that varies more than tenfold. Or you prepare the device the same way, but you obtain, again, more than an order of magnitude change in the resulting resistance from device to device. And we do not like this variability because it limits our ability to use these devices in reliable training of physical neural networks. So the larger such variation, the larger the errors you will get as a result of the use of that physical neural network. Okay? And the range of variability that gives you good reliability is very narrow. So tenfold change is really, really, really large. Okay, so as I said, the key question related to this challenge is, is, is where is the filament forming in the device layer and what are the resulting properties? So these oxides that we use as device are not uniform single crystal layers. They have microstructural variability, they have microchemical variability that affects the voltage distribution in the operation of the device and ends up forming filaments at different locations with different chemistries and resulting in different properties. So that's a big challenge in this, in this field. How do we understand where these filaments form and how can we control them? So in our research, we are very also excited and curious about this problem. And we are working with two different approaches that can be integrated down the line. One is related to controlling the microstructure of the oxide, for example, the grain boundaries. And the other is controlling the microchemistry of the device via insertion of dopants into the oxide layer. Both with the goal of localizing the oxygen vacancy conducting 
filament so that we reduce the extent of stochasticity for where these filaments form. So inducing either microstructural or microchemical preferential sites for the vacancies to form so as to reduce the resulting stochasticity. Okay, so that takes me to the results that I want to share with you, which is the key point being that as we change the microchemistry of the oxide for resistive switching with dopants, the higher the electronegativity of those dopants, the better the resulting switching consistency we can obtain. And I will explain why. This work is in collaboration with my colleague, Nicholas Fang at MIT, together with our students. And we have done the theoretical computational part of this study and the experiments originated from Nicholas Fang's group. So when Nicholas and his student came to us a couple of years ago, they had a very interesting set of observations. They're using alumina as the switching layer. And if they do two things, they would observe significant improvement in the switching consistency. First is split one layer into multiple layers that are thinner. And second and more important is that when you are defining the device area, for example, if you have focused on beam milling, do that milling after depositing the top metal contact, that is gold in this case. And especially this latter step, milling through the top gold contact has given rise to much improvement in, in the um, consisting, uh, in the switching properties. So here is their data where the, the left data where you see a lot of variability in the current voltage curves is when you mill without the gold contact, when you're defining the device area and put the gold contact layer later. And the right one is you put the gold contact first and mill through the gold contact layer as you define the device area and the resulting switching curves are very consistent with each other. So where is this coming from was the question that initiated our collaboration. And our hypothesis that we proposed for this observation is that when you mill through the gold contact layer, you're actually implanting gold atoms and gold atoms are highly electronegative. And that serves to make it easier to form oxygen vacancies and these can become then preferential sites for the formation of oxygen vacancies or oxygen vacancy clusters that can be building blocks for, for filament or network of filament formation. And similarly to gold, then we can also propose to use other electronegative ions such as platinum and palladium and contrast them to regular transition metals such as copper, titanium and excess aluminum. So this allowed us to explore the electron affinity effect in this, in this switching platform. So here I'm showing you the computed oxygen vacancy formation energy in undoped alumina, which is very large. And compare that to doped alumina with electronegative dopants versus with regular transition metals. So in undoped alumina, it's difficult to form an oxygen vacancy. When you remove an oxygen, the electrons are trapped at the oxygen vacancy site forming F centers, color centers, because it's very high energy to transfer these electrons to aluminum or to the conduction band. Whereas when you insert gold or platinum or palladium, these electronegative ions, as I will show in the next slide, are easy to take the electrons left from oxygen and therefore reduce the formation energy of oxygen vacancies. So by looking at the density of states, electronic density of states and the partial charge density plot, we can deduce two, two conclusions. So maybe I will just scroll this for sake of clarity. Okay, yeah, we can deduce two conclusions. So when we insert an electronegative ion like gold into alumina, we create in-gap states, okay? And 
Then as we extract an oxygen to create an oxygen vacancy, these in-gap states, especially the gold S states, take up that electron left from the oxygen and lower their energy. And, and this is the key reason for the lower oxygen vacancy formation in the, in the doped alumina. In addition, you can see the gold and oxygen charge, which actually goes down when you insert gold. So there is charge transfer to gold in gold doped alumina that weakens the aluminum and oxygen bonds, making it easier to break them and, and remove oxygen. So both the weaker aluminum oxygen bonds and the in-gap states introduced by gold that take the electron left from oxygen are able to reduce the oxygen vacancy formation energy significantly in alumina. And it's not limited to individual oxygen vacancies. We see a similar result for oxygen vacancy cluster formation, which is important for extended conducting zone formation in switching. And so if we create not one, but four oxygen vacancies, let's say surrounding the gold dopant, we can see that the formation energy per oxygen vacancy in such a cluster is again much lower than the undoped case. Moreover, this vacancy cluster is strongly binding to the gold site compared to the regular transition metals. So not only that we are making it easier to create oxygen vacancies in a gold or platinum or palladium doped system, but we are also making the cluster of vacancies preferentially form at these dopant sites as seen from the large binding energies. And then our argument is that these clusters of preferential oxygen vacancies can serve as building blocks for conducting filaments or networks of conducting filaments to induce switching. And, and why we say that? Because oxygen vacancy clusters themselves introduce defect states that become the local conducting or tunneling uh, zones. So oxygen vacancy formation indeed serves as a local conducting zone that can then percolate to switch the conductance of your whole alumina layer. So again, repeating these last few slides, insertion of gold and palladium and platinum high electronegativity ions into alumina reduces the oxygen vacancy and vacancy cluster formation and makes it preferential to form these vacancy clusters near the dopant site, which can then serve as building blocks to form conducting filaments. So based on our predictions, we went ahead and did new experiments comparing palladium, gold and platinum, so the high electronegativity dopants, to transition metal dopants, copper, aluminum, and titanium. As you can see from the raw data, as well as from the, from the distribution plots, the experimental results are consistent with our theoretical predictions, such that the high electronegativity dopants, palladium, gold, platinum, gives rise to very good consistency, whereas regular transition metals that do not make it as easy to create the oxygen vacancies are not as repeatable, as controllable as the top three. And again, the sharper these distributions, the more consistent the switching, and those are the dopants or ions that are able to reduce the oxygen vacancy formation and cluster formation um, energies. So in summary for this part, high electronegativity ions, such as gold, platinum, palladium, make it easier to form oxygen vacancies and bind oxygen vacancies, pinning the conductive building blocks, therefore improving the, improving the consistency, reducing the variability of the resulting electrical properties for resistive switching. So in summary for both parts, 
My perspective for the first part is that these ion-based electrochemical devices that can emulate aspects of synapses are very, very exciting and actually solves a key outstanding issue that is the variability, unpredictability that have been a key roadblock that inhibited wide ranging applications of energy efficient neuromorphic computing based on filamentary mechanisms. They are low energy, repeatable, controllable, and, and they are new. There are different um, challenges perhaps associated with them, but their ability to controllably modulate conductance reversibly and repeatably is, is a very important advancement for the field. And moreover, the ability to, to do this with ions, not necessarily just proton, but also other ions such as neurotransmitter ions, maybe a long time down the path could also couple to neuroscience studies to, to assist with, with diseases that could be, that could be um, interfaced with, with such electrochemical synapses. And for the latter part, as I said, a big challenge is the ability to control these filaments where they form and the resulting properties and harnessing point defects, point defect engineering through the dopant application that I have shown as an example is one way that could allow us to advance in the direction of controlling those filaments and improving their predictability. And their advantages, of course, we are using a simpler two-terminal geometry with binary oxides that are used in CMOS for a long time. So they have a starting point advantage, but if you can advance the field by controlling the properties of the resulting filaments through microstructure and point defect chemical uh, control, um, that would be very helpful also for this, for this field. Good, so with that, I will end here and thank you so much for listening and I'm happy to hear your questions.